Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. There's going to be um, some information here that we probably went over at the breakfast symposium, but um, it's good information to uh, take note on. <clears throat> and, um, you know, health insurance, I always say when I have to do this presentation, I'm like, you all came to California just for this presentation, right? It, health insurance is so exciting. But it is important. So, you know, we just kind of have to, you know, hammer down this is, you know, what it is right now, this is where it could go, and what do you need to know so that you're covered and you have the best access to care. So um, we know the different types of uh, health plans that are out there. You have your private plans and then you have um, your public plans. The private plans are those that you're getting through um, either your employer or uh, that you purchase your, on your own through the health exchanges or whether it's outside of the marketplace and you work with um, a broker. The public plans are your Medicare, your um, Medicaid or CHIP programs, the children's health insurance programs that uh, the states have, VA benefits, and TRICARE. Oops, I went the wrong way. Here we go. So right now, we currently have the ACA. We have it. It hasn't changed yet. The day after the election, my phone did not stop ringing <laughs> as everybody <laughs> called and said, what's going to happen to my insurance? What's going to happen to my insurance? So right now, the ACA is still in effect. We know that could potentially change, but right now it is in effect, and we do have these protections um, and more options for obtaining coverage. So we do have the elimination of pre-existing condition exclusions, lifetime and annual caps, uh, out-of-pocket costs for preventative services for, you know, um, mammograms, breast, you know, screenings for breast cancer, cholesterol, diabetes, depression, immunizations, um, prescription coverage. Uh, it eliminated termination of coverage due to any health issue. You could not be diagnosed with something and then dropped from your plan. Um, and Medicaid was expanded in 27 states with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the exchanges were created in each state. Um, some under, you know, the federal and some states manage them themselves. And there was expansion for dependent coverage. So right now with the dependent coverage, uh, your child can stay on your policy up until the age of 26. Um, it does not require that they have to live with you. They don't have to be, um, you know, a dependent or claimed on your tax return. They don't have to be a full-time student. Um, they can go get married, live elsewhere, and still be covered under your plan. And fortunately for you, you don't have to buy it for their spouse because you're not required to do that. <laughs> it's not allowed. <laughs> so for those that shop the marketplace, um, there's different levels of coverage. We have the bronze, silver, gold, and your platinum plans. Um, all the plans are essentially the same, and they offer the same benefits and the annual out-of-pocket max and caps um, that are set. It, it's really the big difference is cost sharing. So, like right now, currently this year, the out-of-pocket maximum for an individual is 7,150, and the family's 14,300. Next year, that'll increase a little bit, um, but the big difference is cost sharing, and that's through the out-of-pocket expenses. So, you know, to get an idea of what your true cost is going to be, you need to look at that premium amount plus your out-of-pocket amount. A lot of times, for patients, you know, especially with a rare disease it's going to be more beneficial for you to opt for maybe the higher premium plan because you're going to have less out-of-pocket cost towards your treatments and expenses. So open enrollment for next year, we have no idea. Is it the ACA? Is it the American Health Care Act? 
We don't know at this time. What we do know is that there is going to be some version of Obamacare available. Um, we do anticipate that the consumer choices are going to be, you know, restricted. We've already seen that some in the healthcare market. Um, you know, I think we talked about that a little bit this morning with um, not a lot of PPO plans that are being offered. Um, but we can expect it's also going to be a shorter open enrollment period. CMS is um, issuing a proposed rule to cut back I think it's six weeks, yeah, the open enrollment period by six weeks. So you're not going to have this long length of time to decide what you want to do. Um, you need to start thinking about it now. Now for Medicare plans, do we have Medicare beneficiaries in here? So, okay, we do have a few. <coughs> um, it's a valuable resource to contact your SHIP program. Every state has it. It's a state, and health, state health insurance assistance program. And they have beneficiaries that work to, um, or I'm sorry, volunteers to work with the beneficiaries to let them know what plans uh, they're eligible for and kind of help them do comparison to see what's going to work best uh, with them. So you can always go to our website um, to, con to look at uh, the, stealth, the state health insurance assistance program. We have a list of all the states and their contact information. But uh, the biggest thing I hear from Medicare patients is deciding on the coverage that they should get. You know, when somebody's getting ready to um, go over to Medicare, I get the frantic call of, is sub-Q going to be covered or is IVIG going to be covered and what, you know, what secondary should I pick? And I can't give definitive answers because Every state is different as to like what supplemental plans are offered or what advantage plans are offered. It's not across the board nationwide. So I don't have access to the specific plans that you're eligible for. That's where you can get that um, information from your SHIP program. But I can certainly try to help you uh, narrow down and compare what's going to work better. Um, traditional Medicare, your Part B medical coverage, is going to cover your IV treatment at 80%. Now, what you need to consider is what is your diagnosis and what is your method of administration? Because Medicare does limit home infusions and sub-Q infusions to certain diagnoses. So while you may still be able to obtain coverage for your diagnosis of a hypogam or a subclass, you may have to go to an infusion center to get IV, and they'll cover it under your pharmacy benefit as opposed to medical benefit. Um, so the first thing you want to look at is your diagnosis and your method of administration. And then you want to decide, am I going to get Part B and a Medigap plan, or do I want to get an Advantage plan? Some people that have Medicare through disability don't really have an option. Every state's different, um, but some states, you're, they're not eligible to get a secondary plan. So it's either they just have Medicare Part B, or they can opt for an Advantage plan, which kind of acts like an all-in-one insurance. Um, you're actually with a private plan. You might get a Cigna or a Humana or Blue Cross. Um, they have to provide the same coverage or benefits offered by Medicare. Um, and some people do this because they get some prescription coverage. However, I can tell you from almost everybody that calls me with an Advantage plan, they do not have any better coverage for their IVIG or sub-Q than if they had Medicare alone. Sometimes they have higher coinsurance. I've had people call and say, I owe 30% for my treatment. So you, I understand why some people choose it because they don't have much option and they want to get prescription coverage in addition to their medical, but you really have to find out the specifics of how that plan is going to cover your treatment. So as we said, every plan is different. Um, comparing these plans and the coverage details, there's so much information you need to know. Um, one of the questions I get all the time is when somebody's um, maybe switching or, you know, looking to sign up is, is Blue Cross better than Cigna? Is Aetna better than United Healthcare? And I don't have an answer for that. It's the plan design. How is this plan designed and what is your coverage? Now, 
when it comes to choosing an insurance company, it may be important to you, uh, based on your diagnosis, that you might want to know their medical policy and what they, um, you know, what requirements they have in order to uh, get authorized for treatment. But everything else is down to the plan design. You know, what is your out-of-pocket maximum? Do you have a deductible? Is the du deductible included in your out-of-pocket maximum, or is it in addition to? I've gotten calls from people that say, I thought I only owed um, a $5,000 out-of-pocket max, but my pharmacy is still trying to collect from me. <clears throat> well, they had a $2,000 deductible and a $5,000 out-of-pocket max, but it was in addition to, and they still met under that $7,000 cap. So you have to ask that question. Um, you want to know if your uh, immunoglobulin is going to be covered under the medical or the prescription plan. And um, how is it covered? Do you have a coinsurance? Do you just have a copay for the treatment? And do you have options for site of care? Are you limited um, to where you have your treatment? What method of administration that you have? And um, you know, are you going to have to potentially change your treatment plan with this uh, insurance coverage? Out of network benefits. Um, very good for a lot of people who opt to stay with their physician if they're not in network. Um, so you want to ask whether you have that option, um, especially those that travel and are out of state. Uh, but you have to consider <clears throat> that out-of-network benefits do not apply to your out-of-pocket maximum limit. So what expenses are included there? It's um, your deductibles, your co-payments, co-insurance, anything you're paying towards your medical care, not your premiums, not services that are denied. If something's denied, you opt to pay for that lab work or you know that prescription. Um, that's great, but that's not going to be applied towards your uh, maximum amount. And also the out-of-network benefits. So if you need help comparing the plans, um, we do have our insurance toolkit. Has anybody taken a look at that? No? It has a lot of great information, and we keep things updated um, regarding amounts and any changes, uh, you know, that's been going on in healthcare. But it actually has um, comparison worksheets, so you can literally list everything from, you know, this is what I have in prescriptions, this is how many doctor visits I have, and it helps you compare those costs with the different plans. So it's a great resource to help you choose your plan. Other resources that we have, you can always call us at the 800 number um, regarding any issues you're having with insurance or if you need help with um, choosing an insurance plan. Also, our advocacy center, just to stay up to date with the changes in health care, make sure um, you get signed up for those action alerts. It's really important for our community. And you can always email me if you have specific questions. Right now, I am going to turn it over to Debbie, who's going to talk about the importance of health insurance, um, but from your provider's perspective. So welcome, Debbie. My favorite subject in the whole wide world, insurance companies. Oh, if you only knew. So I've been with Children's Hospital Philadelphia for 28 years. I've been with immunology for 18 years now. And when I first started, I may have been on the phone with an insurance company an hour a week. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, it's like eight hours a day. It really has changed my life. And I'm, I feel that I don't give the patients the care that they deserve anymore because I'm constantly on the phone. I've been on the phone with medical directors. I have uh, <laughs> literally my favorite story is this medical director wouldn't allow a child to come in for a one-time dose in our outpatient infusion center. And I took the phone and I banged it against the wall and I said, did you hear that? <laughs> and he was like, what did you just do? And I said, I need you to listen to me. And he did. And he kind of hung up on me abruptly. But two hours later, I got a call from his secretary and I did get the one-time dose. So I want to go into how you are in charge and you are responsible for your insurance co coverage. Try to stay informed, know your rights under the law, and be proactive. If you're changing um, from, to a new insurance company, 
um, if you have any type of paperwork that has a deadline, make sure that you're aware of the effective dates. We have had patients who, if you have paperwork that needs to be filled out, if you miss that deadline when it needs to be back, you will be out of insurance for at least a month until it gets reactivated. So that's the last thing that we want to happen to you. If you ever need help filling it out, um, I, take, I do whatever I can to help the patients. Don't ignore communications from your insurance company. Okay, you will get information in the mail. If you don't know what it means, I have sent families back to their employers and I've had them reach out to their human resources. Sometimes they have a benefits coordinator or somebody that you can ask questions. If you don't get the answers you want, ask them to direct you to somebody who can answer your questions. It's really important for you to do that. And if you don't get anywhere, call me. I will get an answer for you one way or another. And you will, um, you know, I've even written um, letters of medical necessity because if you have an employer say they're now changing to a different insurance company, we will write a letter stating the diagnosis, you know, the product that you're on, the site of care that you're on, all the information we can put into a letter to make sure that we can get you the insurance you deserve. I've had families who, um, a couple families actually had very good success with that. They were able to um, have an, uh, the employer actually pick a plan designated for that child or children in the family. I even had, I don't know what that was. I, oh, there you go. <laughs> I was gonna say, I also have a squeezy ball that I throw against the wall and I, I'm not throwing it against the wall right now. When I talk to insurance companies, see, they know what we're talking about. <laughs> so, um, but I, like I said, I have had much success where I actually had a couple employers literally pick a specific plan for their family. So they were able to have the product, the site of care, everything that they absolutely needed. It does work. We have a voice. And definitely keep pushing, I'm telling you. Keep pushing, 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 and you will get an answer. Um, I start out nice, and then I start to get angrier and angrier the longer I go. And if I really have to yell, I'll yell. I have no problem yelling. I get what my patients need. Know your benefits to prevent barriers. Oh, are there barriers today? More barriers than I even want to think about. And thank God I can still get my hair dyed because it's really important. <laughs> do I need a referral for a specialist? Sometimes you do. The other piece is we do have families that come from all different states to see us. And we want to see if they're at a network. If they're at a network, sometimes we have to pull the primary physician in to get that referral. And you want to make sure that primary physician's office has the correct information. You want to make sure that they have a diagnosis code. If you're going to get labs drawn that day, it's important for them to put that also um, listed on the referral. What services require prior authorization? What doesn't require prior authorization is really more the question these days. So obviously, most of your IG therapy requires a prior auth. Your site of care requires a prior auth. Sometimes your supplies even require prior auth. The cool thing that we're running into a lot is our patients now are attending colleges. So keep in the back of your mind, we've had a couple of patients who will go to college out of state. If they go out to college out of state, you want, it's really important for you to know that some of the states require a physician from that state to write the orders. At Children's Hospital, we can't write the orders for a patient who's attending college in Rhode Island. So with that, it takes coordination, it happens, we're able to locate an immunologist near the student's college, then we get that patient an appointment, and obviously we need to do this ahead of time. So you get the appointment, we fax all the clinicals and our information over to that physician, and then it's then working on the site of care. Where is this student going to go to get the services that they need? Are they going to go to an outpatient day hospital? Are they going to go down to a step-down infusion? center to get the infusions. So we try to get all our ducks in a row before the student starts their freshman year at college just to take some stress off the student and to know that we're all set, we're ready to go. So it just takes a little bit of coordination, but it happens. The other pieces that we're very successful at, a lot of students are studying abroad today. Depending on the product, we try and get the student on a product that works best for them. We're able to work with a specialty pharmacy 
and get a prior auth for six months. We pack the student up, we get all the supplies, we supply a letter for TSA so they can ha take their products with them onto the plane, and the student goes away for six months and has a wonderful time and is able to do their infusions as they study abroad. So I think that's really been a lot of fun for me, actually, and I'm so happy that these kids can do this. Does your plan require labs? I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of these labs, I, especially for us, we're seeing more and more labs need to be done at a Quest or a LabCorp or some capitated site, they call it. So a lot of times, try to know where you need to go to get your labs drawn. And of course, this is kind of putting the puzzle together a little bit too, depending on where your deductibles are in the year when you come to see us. Um, if you have a secondary insurance, if the primary doesn't cover it, but the secondary does. And what I'm talking about is if you want to have infusion, say, done at CHOP that day of your visit when you come for follow-up, then sometimes you can still get the labs drawn at CHOP, but you also need to know what you're responsible for as far as coverage, okay? Um, is IG therapy subject to a strictive formulary? Of course it is. I, this is, makes me crazy. A lot of your insurance companies, they're designating what product you can have. And it's making me crazy. And the other piece is we have like in, the, um, in our area, out in the Philadelphia region, we even have where some insurances are dictating what site of care um, you have to go to. A lot of our blues have pushed our patients out of our outpatient infusion center. So with that then, a lot of our families, they don't want to go to home care. So then we have to find them a step down infusion center. So there are options. If you don't want to go to home care, you should be able to go to a step down infusion center. Um, we also had a insurance company designate a specific home care agency. So um, with that, you know, you know, I ride my specialty pharmacies. I make them every quarter. They have to send me a list of my patients. I know when they got infused, especially if they're sub-Q. I want to know when they got infused. I want to know what needle length they're on. I want to know what tubing they're on, and I want to know what side effects they have, how often you're calling them, and when they are receiving their shipments, especially my college kids. A lot of my college kids fall off the face of the earth when they go to college. <laughs> I want to make sure <laughs> they're receiving their treatments, okay? I want to know that they're accepting deliveries. If they don't accept a delivery, you're to call me, and I call that patient and find out why they're not accepting their deliveries. And with all this, you know, it's just constantly, um, working together. We try to work together as a team, but my specialty pharmacies know that I want this quarterly report because I want to know how my patients are doing. Will I be required to switch from my current IG therapy to at least cost medically necessary brands? Wow. Can I mention Aetna here? <laughs> Aetna. Wow. It's just been, uh, it's really been a roller coaster. So they started this effective April 1st where they selected four products. Um, they're 10% products, 5% products. I mean, it's just been uh, really interesting. My patients that are on it are able to stay on it. The reauthorization process has been pretty interesting. They've been, um, they made me send them clinicals for a patient who was up for a reauth for nine years. I had to send clinicals to get that patient reauth. So, and it wants to throw, you know, throw the ball in the air right now, but I will um, fight. My patients so far, knock on wood, that ha are on, you know, a sub-Q type product, they are able to stay on it. But the patients, I have to now educate all the physicians and tell them that if there's a patient that's going to be starting, you know, we need to make sure that we have educated the patient and, you know, we try to help the patients choose the best product for them. Does the plan supply me with a case manager? Most of your plans do. I mean, you're entitled to ask for a case manager. I've worked with some case managers that have been incredible, and I've worked with some that it's almost like their hands are tied. They really can't do much. So I, you know, so, I don't know. I want to not say that they're useless, but they're kind of useless to me and to the patient. I'm like, what are you there for? But um, so I would say if you ask for a case manager and you're not getting the service you deserve, ask for a different case manager. You know, you deserve it. You're, you know, a lot of us are paying for this. So if you went and you took your car to a shop for brakes and you pulled out and you had no brakes, you would go back in and complain, right? This is a service a lot of us are paying for. You have a right and you deserve what you deserve. 
once you choose the plan, you cannot change till the next open enrollment period. I mean, that's pretty much standard. There can be a very unique case, but um, I, I can't even imagine what we'd have to go through. But if we had to do it, we had to do it. Hemoglobin payer criteria. Obviously, it can change any time, like I just talked to you about. Aetna did this starting April 1st, and it's just been um, very interesting. Um, you need to know your plan. You need to know what your deductibles are, what your co-pays are. How often do I need to come in for follow-up? How often do I need labs to be drawn? Um, a lot of times when we have to re-auth patients, we need labs, I need clinicals, I need this information. So once again, when I get these reports from the specialty pharmacies, I'm also having them list an expiration date so I can try and get you in um, for an appointment to see us, but most of our patients and are coming in for labs and a visit every six months. We kind of just made it standard. So this way nobody has any, you don't want a disruption in therapy. Because let's face it, if you have a reauthorization coming up, you don't want a disruption in your therapy. We, we need to supply the clinicals and make sure that we're on top of it. The insurance companies do have a clear evidence-based criteria that has to be where our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted. and. If we don't supply them what they need, they can deny it. And then we have to go through a peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, which we do, and then we usually get it off without a problem. But like I said, if you're coming in for a new authorization, you want to make sure that um, if it's new, we, we kind of know what we have to supply. It's a letter of medical necessity, the labs. If we have somebody who's diagnosed with specific antibody, I even supplied, Dr. Sullivan has a phenomenal article that she did for the IDF that I attach because a lot of these medical directors would throw it out and tell me that they won't authorize it. So I thought, oh, I'll fix you. So now <laughs> I supply an article because now the medical director will review it and they have some data. A lot of times they want data. They just want information. So I'm like, ha, huh, you got it. So I, you know, specific antibody sometimes is really hard. We had a kid who was, she was 18 and she had like 40 sinusitis. She got a pneumovac seven times, and they were going to deny it. I'm like, are you kidding me? What do you want now? So I grabbed <laughs> Dr. Sullivan's article, and I stuck it in the machine, and within two hours, I had an authorization. This guy was just looking for data. He just totally was looking for data. But a lot of times, I've even trained my immunologists to make sure what they have to do a peer-to-peer, -peer, that they have to ask for an immunologist because sometimes when you get that medical director on the phone, they don't know anything about immunology. So I've really worked hard with trying to train them to say, you're entitled to ask to speak to an immunologist. And sometimes we have to fight a little bit harder to make sure we get one on the phone. Specialty pharmacy carve-outs. Oh, my favorite. CVS, they're my nightmare. So I just don't like those people. Um, so. With specialty pharmacy, you know what they're wonderful to do to me? On a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock, they have the nerve to call me and say, oh, your patient needs a re-off. I said, really? Not only that, my phone is ringing, and the family is now calling me because they literally called the family and said, your doctor's office isn't responding to us. They haven't supported the documentation. Ah, oh, liars. They just <laughs> called me two minutes ago. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So no, don't play games with me. So uh, it, they just irritate me. So I've tried to teach my families, specialty pharmacies, um, we do supply the documentation and we do give it to them ASAP when they call us. So if you ever get that phone call, nine times out of 10 is not our fault. It's their fault because they're not up on their game. But the other piece is if you're on um, with a specialty pharmacy, you say you're on a subcutaneous product, I feel that a lot of times they don't off ask the appropriate questions as far as side effects. And I want you to take pictures. When you start with them, take pictures of what's coming in the mail. So you make sure that if something ever goes wrong, uh, you have a side effect or you're starting to have little things happen, sometimes the wrong thing gets put in the box. Not, hey, we're all human, things happen, but they need to fix it. And I don't want you going where something is really not right. The electronic patient record. This is a wonderful tool. 
and we have had families use this, and this is something that you can have all this information. In the beginning, it, it does seem like a lot of work to list the diagnosis when, <laughs> based on the data, your treatment history, the labs, but everything is consolidated in one location for you. So it is really a nice tool. Um, I, like I said, some I know it can be a lot of work at first, but once you have it there, it's there, and you just have to hit a button, and you have all your information. So if you have a chance, if you can try to use that, that would be great. And we talked a lot about Medicare, um, our supplies and nursing services covered. I, like I said, it depends. A lot of times um, they say you can only have so many visits in a year, so you need to know that. I haven't had any problems with any of my patients with um, if they need more services, I tell the home care company, and they pretty much do what I ask. The 21st Century Cures Act, we're just going to pray and continue to move forward and hope as time goes on we hear more information about it. I think Nicole did a great job covering it. So, And who to call for what? Infections, hospitalization, illnesses, changes in medications. It's really important. We really try to take a team approach. So your primary should know, your monology team, your pharmacist, as well as nurse. If there's any, I mean, we're looking at um, how you're doing clinically, your clinical response. It's not all about numbers. So I tell my families, if, you know, your child's having lots of infections, call me. Or make sure you're documenting it. Because we need to know, like I said, um, we might need to change the dose of the product if you're having lots of breakthrough infections. I've had primaries call me and say, look, I'm now on my third antibiotic for your patient. I don't know what to do. Sometimes it's a matter of documenting in the letter for some of our patients that when they do get sick, we want them to get a 21-day course. We don't want to do the 10-day course and then work our way up. So if you're somebody who has chronic sinus infections, then maybe that's something we just need to think about or discuss with your primary and work with immunologists. But, you know, primaries are pretty involved, and they really do, um, they really do care about you. And like I said, if you document it, or I even tell my families to call me, if your child's having lots of infections, then we might need to go up a gram and see how you do, or change it from every three weeks, or four weeks to every three weeks. Your supplies, your tubing, and your pump. Anything that doesn't come in the box or that's appropriate, you need to let the specialty pharmacy know as well as the immunology team. If I find out that you're not getting the correct supplies and things have been happening for a couple weeks, I get angry. I ride that insurance company. <laughs> side effects, same thing. Any side effects. I really would prefer not for you to come in in six months and tell me that, you know, I've had all these side effects. Hydration is huge for IVIG as well as sub-Q, especially with summertime and it being warm. So we really need to work on um, your side effects. I, you know, we all need to know, the immunology team, the pharmacy, as well as the nurse. Scheduling infusion and nursing visit. The only piece I want to add in here is if you don't receive deliveries, that's kind of huge, so be careful, especially if you're on a subcutaneous product. I actually had a family who, um, was uh, a, a child we didn't realize was not getting the deliveries. So what happened was when the re-auth came to occur, the uh, insurance company made him go off for three months because he wasn't getting the deliveries like he was supposed to, and they were on it. The insurance company knew that he was skipping several months. Oh, and now I'll take a delivery. So be very careful because that insurance company, well, they did it to us. We couldn't believe it. So we had to stop treatment for three months revisit labs, and then resubmit again. So I'm just saying just be careful with your deliveries because, I don't know, that just shocked me. I was like, ooh, they know. So <laughs> they knew. So who has managed your care? Try to be your own advocate. Make, your, make a journal, um, put it in your phone, um, call your immunologist, whatever works best for you. And when you speak to an insurance company or a specialty pharmacy, anybody, you know, try to get a phone number Okay, try, I'm going to get told to shut up. Okay, get a phone number, a reference number for the call. Um, because if you call the doctor's office, if you're having issues, make sure you call the doctor's office, okay? And then if you give me a reference number, then I know who to call. So your health care team doesn't know what you don't tell them. We need a responsive health care team to help you. You deserve that. Insurance changes, if you're changing insurances, make sure you call your specialty pharmacy, your immunologist, wherever you're going. 
Regular ongoing monitoring and communication is essential. These are your resources. The IDF is an incredible resource for you. I tell all my families and patients about it. Your, I, your manufacturers, they do have copay assistance. They can help you. Don't hesitate on calling them. A lot of that goes through your specialty pharmacies. Enroll in manufacturer resources at the start of care. There's foundations. Jeffrey Modell Foundation is a wonderful asset. Government programs. And my last quick story I'll tell you is the Attorney General. I had a skid baby where this um, insurance company was kind of dangling us. And when we needed labs, the attorney, um, they told the family, we'll decide what we're going to pay for. Then the baby needed IVIG because it was going to go for a bone marrow transplant. Started um, IVIG, they gave me a really hard time. They told me that um, we'll decide what we're going to pay for. Okay, this family, um, they just, they couldn't hang in there to find out what they were going to have to pay. I was so ticked off when this lady told me we'll decide what we're going to pay. I called the Attorney General's office. I reported the insurance company. And she said, what do we need to do? And she said, I just need the mom to fill out a form. So the mom was computer savvy. I walked her through filling out the form. And within two hours, I got a year's authorization for that baby to get IVIJ. So, <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, hopefully, we can answer your questions. And I'm hoping you can take something away. And if you ever need anything, don't ever hesitate and call me, because I will help you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we do have a few questions here that we're going to um, go through and do our best to answer. Um, the first one I have is, can you describe in more detail the current Medicare issues about sub-Q, specifically with high cuvia? Um, we did talk about this this morning. Uh, there has been an issue with uh, the Medicare sub-Q treatments due to the 21st Century Cures Act. Essentially, it, the issue in itself is the timing. The um, payment amounts were reduced, but payments for additional um, services like think um, <laughs> think DME. I'm sorry, I thought I heard you moan like oh. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> and, um, yeah. and um, you know are going to be added, which will help balance out that reduction of payment. However, at the last minute they decided to not implement that until later date. So initially, all the specialty pharmacies were hit with this big reduction in payment and these other services not being paid for, and they're struggling. They're struggling to keep patients. Some of them are losing money by keeping patients. So we have heard um, there have been some specialty pharmacies who have dropped their patients or um, are trying to get them on uh, Cuvitru, which is a short-term, um, I guess a short-term, well, yeah, very, very short-term <laughs> um, way to deal with it, but that will end probably by the fall. So, I mean, it's really just the specialty pharmacies are waiting. They're waiting to see what's going to happen. We are working and hoping that we're going to get this, you know, um, implementation date moved up so that it won't be such a huge struggle for the specialty pharmacies. But we have to consider, too, you know, for the Medicare patients, not only is this problematic for them in just getting the service, um, and having it provided to them, but a lot of them are getting assistance from the specialty pharmacies, you know, towards copay. So we don't know what's going to happen with those type of assistance programs. So um, I hope that better explains it. You want to go through one? Um, one of the questions is, is it better option to buy a higher, where the premium payments and less deductible or less premium and a higher deductible. Stay away from the higher deductible. That's my answer to that. Be very careful. I mean, we're dealing with a family right now who's on IVIG, and their deductible is like 15000 it, it, It's outrageous, and we're doing everything we can to actually try to put them in a home care and try and get them some copay assistance. But um, definitely try to stay away from that higher deductible is my answer to that one. Okay. Um, 
Oh, here's another Medicare question. What will the coverage be if the home infusion demonstration is discontinued? Uh, Option Care has told me that I would be able to continue infusions at home but have to pay for supplies and nursing. Um, that if it is to be discontinued, that is exactly what would happen. It would go back to what it was before, you know, we got the demonstration project where you had to pay for your supplies and, and nursing fees. Um, like we discussed this morning, there are extra funds available due to the number that enrolled and we're hoping to get an extension until um, the final decision is made as, you know, as to whether it will become permanent benefit. Um, but I don't have a specific answer on that at this time. Another question is, I'm leaving my employer and going into consulting self-employed as a PIP. PI patient were the type, type, top three things. So obviously you want to make sure your product is covered, the site of care, and your supplies. And I would make sure that um, you find out what, uh, which benefit it's going to be under. Is it going to be under your medical benefit or is it going to be under your pharmacy benefit? Because if it's under your pharmacy benefit, then you'll go to my favorite place called CVS Caremark probably. But it, that's okay. That's okay. As long as, you know, if you've... Uh, um, you know, if you're on a, um, a product that would have to do that. But like I said, just make sure you make sure the product's covered, the site of care where you want it, and um, make sure you find out is it under your medical benefit or if your um, pharmacy benefit, because that does make a difference for some people. Do you mind if I add to that? Just no, one thing. Course. I'm just going to add one thing to that. Um, Keep in mind, too, that, you know, we always talk about the marketplace as being an option to purchase a plan. Um, if, you know, depending on where you're located, if you go to your marketplace and you feel like, you know, that whatever plans are available are not going to be sufficient for you or your family, you do have the option to, you know, shop privately or use a broker. Sometimes these plans are a bit more expensive than in the marketplace and then you're not eligible for, you know, subsidies and whatnot. But I have talked to patients who have found very good plans and at, you know, affordable rates by going out on their own. So that is, a, is an option in addition to the healthcare market. So um, I have here, it says, son is on our insurance until September 2018 when he will turn 26. Um, good coverage. It's a current job for insurance. I'm sorry. Oh, his current job for insurance enrollment will be November 2017. Problem is he may not stay with the company. Can he be covered by two insurance companies? Yes, he can. He, he can stay on your plan and opt to take the employer coverage as well. Um, and then the other thing is that if he were to leave that job early, um, you know, and he has turned, you know, he, he can always shop through the marketplace as well. But yes, he can have the two plans. Okay. So this one says, would you say that disruptions in insurance are due to expired clinicals? Probably. I mean, I would just make sure that you know that... Um, yeah, I, oh, there's so much here. But um, disruptions in insurance can be if you're, you've got to watch if your insurance is changing if it, and when it requires a prior auth. And just try to note when you need to go in for follow-up visits as well. Sometimes we're able to even do um, labs. We can resubmit labs and then tell them that you're coming in for a visit soon or sometimes we even... Um, are able to write a letter of medical necessity. You know, this is your diagnosis. This isn't going to change. This is who you are, and we list the new labs, and sometimes that will even buy us some time as well as far as um, when the, uh, in, so you don't get a disruption in your insurance. Uh, why do companies in the health insurance industry change their prices for different companies, ages, illnesses? Oh. I, I, I wish I had a, a magic answer for that. I really do. I, 
I, I have no idea. I, it's just truly amazing to me. I mean, even what Aetna just did, I, I'm still blown away at what they, what they have done. And, you know, like I said, every day is a new day. Every day I walk in and I don't know what's going to knock on the door and how things are going to happen, but I deal with the problems for today and just move forward. Um, what ways do you think we can fight the end of price discrimination in all medical practices? <laughs> that one's got me stumped. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. I mean, I know, I got to tell you, um, the IDF, um, the physicians, uh, all of us, we are all fighting every day for you. Um, we want you to have the quality of life you deserve. And um, we constantly are battling these insurance companies and making sure you do get what you need. And all I can tell you is, you know, I'm going to fight till the end for you folks. So um, whatever we can do to help, but I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, I, I mean, I the did. only thing I guess I would say is, you know, when these, I've t I tell patients all the time, contact your state's insurance commissioner. Make a complaint. That's what they're there for. We can't guarantee they're always going to uh, take care of the situation, but if I were to switch, you know, from one insurance company to another and I found out that there was a $15,000 increase in what, you know, a provider was charging with, I, I, it happens, just report it. You, you got to let them know. Mm -hmm. And the Attorney General is your friend. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are not getting what you deserve, it's a form that you need to walk, go on the computer and, you, can, you know, Report your insurance company. I mean, first talk to them, work it through, and if you're not getting nowhere and you feel you really are banging your head against the wall, don't hesitate. I mean, you know, this is your life, so mm -hmm. don't hesitate on taking care of yourself and being your own advocate. Okay, I just have one more here. It says, I'm 60 and I'm covered by my employer insurance. Uh, when I turn 62, do I stop that and go on Medicare? Are you going to stop working? Oh, there's more. I'm sorry. You don't have to stop your um, employer coverage and, and take Medicare right at 62. You can defer that to some people are doing it at 65, 67. Okay, before you buy insurance, knowing what's covered in terms of illness, IG product, infusion method, and site are all important. In three years of ACA registration, I've never been able to get any detail beyond an exemplar policy to 13 companies, which are quite general. All companies say, we won't provide any detail until after your policy is effective. Is there any way around this? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. First, you call, sometimes the voice gets a little bit louder, and you demand. You, they not, they're not going to be able to give you specifics of, yes, you're covered. And I think that's what they're afraid of, that they're afraid to say, yes, you're going to be covered, because they don't know whether you're going to meet medical necessity for prior authorization. But you can demand to talk to um, a supervisor. You can demand to talk to somebody um, in the prior authorization department. You know, just say, hey, this is a treatment that requires prior authorization. I need to talk to somebody um, regarding coverage. If you give them your diagnosis code, your billing codes, your J codes, I mean, it, it takes persistence, but you can get those um, answers. You can get those. And then, um, oh, and also, you can contact your attorney general's office because I've talked to patients, especially um, it was in New York that were having issues getting information and they called and within a day, they had their uh, questions answered. Okay, so this one, oh, that's a private note to me. <laughs> So I think <laughs> I think we are done unless anybody has a question. For the plan you're looking to buy, you want to know what I need to know, and it, it, the more information you can give them, the more details you're going to get. If you can call them and say, "Look, 
I have CVID. Here's my ICD-10 code. I do this treatment with this product. Here's the J code. Here's the procedure code that is billed. Um, this is a treatment that requires authorization. Can I talk to somebody there? Once they have the codes, they can plug it into their system and say, under that plan, yes, you're going to have 20% coinsurance, $50 copay, whatever it may be. Um, talk to your doctor. <laughs> because when you call the office and you ask me what your code is, I just Google it. <laughs> they reset. They reset, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, absolutely. So you can plan ahead. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.